All right. So what I want to do is um, uh, I'm just going to spend maybe three minutes to uh, summarize a few things on uh, uh, that we left behind on the discussion about discrete data. And then I will move to a completely different lecture on uh, some basic uh, Bayesian things. So you remember, so we talked about the naive Vegas uh, classifier for discrete data. And uh, so the idea is if we have, we have to classify vector sex uh, and uh, uh, the vector x have uh, different futures that can be high dimensional. We denoted the number of futures as D. And uh, so if you have limited data and you have a classifier with D futures and each future, let's say, can take K values, you require a lot of data to be able to make sense out of it. You will not be able to uh, fit the model if you have limited data. So one of the approaches that uh, we discussed the last second, basically on the previous lecture, is to figure out do you actually need these futures, all of them, to do classification. And uh, so maybe what you need to do is you need to figure out which futures are not needed and get rid of them in the context of classification. And a good way to do this is uh, using mutual information between a future XJ and the class labels Y. Um, to, uh, to which extent I'm going to be using later on information theory, I don't know. But for those who have not seen it, it is uh, sort of basically this measure, it tells you how much knowing XJ affects your uncertainty about Y. Okay, so the idea here is that it is uh, not the most probable words that somehow uh, you need to be concerned, but the words that they are very discriminative. And the example that uh, uh, coming from Murphy's book, I'm going to come back to this slide, uh, it is basically an example with two documents uh, that uh, uh, you know you can read more in the notes, but basically. In, if you look at the words that have the highest probability for, mod, for document one or document two, you see words such as subject comes almost with probability one, this, with, but, etc. But these words with high probability are not discriminative. So if you see the word subject, there is no way you can say this is document one or document two. But if you try to compute the mutual information between the different futures, that in this case are the words, and the labels, uh, why, if it is document one or document two, you realize that the most discriminative word is the word windows. And, and uh, in the particular case, this makes sense because one of the documents is really about Microsoft Windows, right? And the other is, uh, I don't know what, maybe about the DOS uh, system, okay? So if you compute mutual information, all right, uh, you can see that the most discriminative words for classification they are not the most probable. So that way, uh, things that don't make a difference in classification, you can actually eliminate and have uh, uh, a smaller number of futures to, to fit. Uh, the mutual information for binary uh, uh, classifiers basically can be computed analytically. And I haven't really done anything in this calculation. Uh, if you use this formula, the summation over the classes, and you have two classes, summation over uh, these binary futures that can take the values 0 or 1. So if you perform this explicitly, you basically come back, come back with uh, 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 a calculation analytically that looks like that in terms uh, of these probabilities that future J would be on in class C. Okay? And uh, uh, these are prior probabilities, you know, and, and so this is there is an analytical formula, basically, that you can use. So it's a trivial calculation to do. All right, so mutual information is very good to do future selection, if you like. And um, uh, so let me uh, discuss very briefly another topic, and then we will move out of this. Uh, so let me remind you, so we use this uh, back of word documents to characterize uh, classification of documents. So you remember it's a naive Bayes classifier. So given the class, the futures, the, uh, the input vector sex decompose over futures. And uh, this probability theta jc is the probability that future j 
in class C is on, 1 minus theta that it's off, okay? So the classifiers basically uh, uh, look like this, okay? So this model, it's a little bit, uh, uh, well, it's a naive model, that's why we call it a naive classifier, but it's also a naive model because it doesn't count how often one word appears. I mean, you can have a word in the document appearing once or 50 times. Does this make any difference? So you can account the number of times the word appears by using, rather than using this Bernoulli distribution, you can use uh, this, uh, uh, you know, multi-nulli, if you like, distribution, where you account that in uh, ni words in document i, the word j appears xij times. So it's a trivial modification that somehow it accounts, you can see here, the number of appearances of each uh, word, okay? So this model uh, is sort of uh, an improvement over what we saw before, but also it's not a good model because uh, these probabilities theta are uh, less than one. So for air words, for example, theta can be way less than one. So uh, this to some power basically means that rare words with this model will never happen. So this model is very good for words that happen all the time, but for rare words, basically this model will not be able to capture it. So we need to do a modification of this, and, and uh, this has implications in some other uh, areas also of machine learning. So let me just tell you what the idea is. The idea here is if you have a word and it appears once uh, or it appears again and again, the probability of the word appearing there seems to be the same. So if a word appeared once, the probability will appear again, it's higher. But this model says no, this probability is theta jc. So how many times a word appeared doesn't seem to make a difference okay, when it comes to the probability. So this is an okay model for words that appear very often. But for air words, it is not appropriate because for air words, if, for example, like in the previous document, uh, it's, if the document is about Windows and suddenly you get the word Windows, it's very possible Windows is going to come back again with a higher probability. So what you need to do is you need to modify this model uh, to account for what is called burstiness of words. So if one word appears once, it will appear again and with a higher probability. So we need to do something that somehow we will be able to adjust this probability here that is not constant. And the way you do this is using this nice modification of this condition of class probabilities using what's called the Dirichlet compound multinomial distribution, where effectively, rather than keeping these probabilities theta constant, we actually average them with the Dirichlet distribution. So we take a weighting averaging of this with the spec to the Dirichlet distribution, and you can write this analytically just like that. Uh, there is much to read, actually, if you click on Wikipedia uh, about this type of distribution and the implications. But let me just tell you in practical uh, sense uh, for discrete data what it means. Imagine you have a ball, and you have uh, uh, little balls inside of different colors. So you remove a ball that has a blue color. All right, so you mark it, you say blue color, you put it back, but also you put an additional blue color ball, which means the next time you pick up a blue, the probability of picking up a blue ball is gonna be twice as much. If let's say you have one and then you have two. So that model accounts for that event, and um, in, uh, it is known or sort of equivalent with a, a polyurn where the probability of selecting a given color increases um, uh, and it's not stationary. So effectively, uh, this can account for the burstiness of rare words, okay, and, and has implications in other areas of machine learning. So I wanted to do it because I think somewhere down the road, I'm gonna be using this distribution for some other applications, so I wanted to be sure that somehow you at least have seen it uh, uh, once. Okay, so um, we're ready to move to, to something more basic now. Uh, 
I have quite an ambitious lecture today, hoping that uh, we will be able to, uh, if possible, to, to finish this topic today, because it's sort of elementary, but it's still also very important. So what we did is we worked with discrete data, and, and maybe some of the examples that I would use again will be discrete data. And uh, we referred to point estimates. We referred to the map estimate, uh, to the, uh, you know, we talked about the posterior mean, um, the posterior median. I don't know if it came in any of the examples. And then I show you uh, which of these estimates uh, is reasonable in the context of a plug-in approximation. You remember? So from all of these estimates, if you're going to say you're going to use the rather than doing full Bayesian prediction, you're going to use the likelihood with some point estimate of the parameters, what that point estimate needs to be. Which one? Which estimate, point estimate of the posterior you're going to use? The expected value, okay? So if you use the map estimate, basically, you don't get this LD regularization uh, effect that we saw, this L1 uh, effect that we saw for discrete distributions. So today what I want to, to, to do is uh, go a little bit uh, beyond uh, point estimates. Because if you do Bayesian statistics, right, in essence, you want to capture your confidence on the prediction. So having point estimates and say, this is the value that I predict is not good enough. We need to do something uh, in the context of uh, 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 confidence for predictions and, and take advantage of the whole um, uh, uh, posterior distribution. All right. Uh, one thing is, is, you know, it's clear, if we don't model uncertainties in the parameters of the model, the predicted distribution is overconfident. So in some sense, the more parameters you have, right, the less confident the model is. And somehow, we need to be able uh, to, to account for this. Now, if you say if you have a thousand parameters or a million parameters, how is it possible that you will not overfit? Well, the answer is you're not going to overfit because when you do predictions, you integrate over the parameter space. So you have a million parameters, but you integrate them out. So you don't overfit. If you do point estimates and you select all the parameters to given values, then as we will see, you overfit. So, uh, but there is a practical point of view why point estimates are not uh, uh, reasonable representations of the posterior distribution. And these two plots that you see here, uh, on their own way, they demonstrate that uh, the map estimate is uh, not a good indicator of what's going on with the posterior. So imagine you have this distribution, and it's a posterior of some parameter that looks like this, and suddenly some sort of delta function. So you're going to say the map estimate is here, but is that map estimate characteristic of the distribution? I mean, it's a point estimate, right? It has probability mass practically uh, very small, but it's not representative of the distribution because the distribution, as you see, the mass is over here. So in this case, the mean is more appropriate than the map estimate. Similarly here, where is the map estimate of this distribution? To the right. Is, let's say, a theta equal to zero, but most of the probability mass is away. So this type of distribution, we're going to use it, for example, to uh, discuss prior models for precisions or variance. Uh, so, you know, this point estimate of having a variance equal to zero is not appropriate for this type of models. So, what is the proper way uh, to figure out uh, if you have many point estimates, uh, what point estimate is more relevant to a particular application? Sort of this has to do with a subject that we will discuss on Thursday. Uh, that goes under the name of decision theory. So I only uh, I cut and paste it from uh, the slide from Thursday. This slide, so I can entice you on what the lecture on Thursday will look like. So let's say uh, theta is the actual value of a parameter, and we come up with a point estimate that can be you know any of the point estimates we have seen, or maybe something different. So what we do is in decision theory we introduce a loss function. All right that uh, somehow de defines how far away we are from the actual estimate of the parameters theta. And depending on that loss function, 
uh, we can uh, discover some of the point estimates we saw on the lectures last week. So for example, if the loss function is uh, uh, this indicator function going with the name 0, 1 loss, because if the parameters are the same, uh, you uh, basically get no loss if they are, right? If, if the parameters are the same, if the parameters are different, all right, the loss is 1. If they are the, the same, uh, the loss is 0. So it comes out, and you don't need very complicated mathematics, if you take this and you try to find uh, <coughs> what is the point estimate to minimize this loss function, the answer comes to be the posterior mode. OK? You may want, actually, before you even see the lecture on Thursday, to play with this derivation. Take this as a loss function and try to find this theta hat that minimizes the 0, 1 loss to show that the uh, point estimate theta hat is actually the posterior mode of the distribution. If the error is the square error, the way that you see here, then the answer comes that the best estimate theta hat is the posterior mean. And if it is the absolute loss, then you get the posterior median. Now, if it is something else, and we will discuss this on uh, Thursday, you may get a uh, way more richer type of uh, estimates. Bottom line, uh, the most appropriate estimate, the way it is defined, is through decision theory. So, you know, we will make a link on this on the lecture on Thursday. All right, uh, let me give you a more fundamental reason why the map estimate is a very bad estimate uh, that you need to be very careful uh, with. So let me actually go before I, I go directly to the example so we can see uh, a pathology with the map estimate. So what I have is I have a distribution of x that you see here. And these are in a histogram form. So these are samples of x. And then what I do is. I pass, I pass each sample of x through some function g uh, to another distribution of y. Right? So you have x, and for each x, you define g of x to be y. And so for all the samples of x's, you plot a histogram of y, so you get a distribution of y like that. So basically, you do a coordinate transformation. And from distribution in x, you go to a distribution on y. What can you tell me about the map estimate of p of x versus the map estimate of p of y? So this is the function, right, that I do the mapping of the histogram. So what can you say about the, the map estimate of x, p of x, versus the map estimate of p of y? Are they the same? They are not the same. OK? So effectively, if you change the parametrization, uh, the map estimate does not follow that parametrization. And the reason for that is uh, probability distributions don't map as functions. They map as distributions. And I remind you now, the way probability distributions map is this fundamental equation that you see here. Very easy to remember. I'm writing this for scalar random variables, but you can extend this to vectors. What is preserved as you go from x to y is not the probability, the way you do with functions, but the probability mass. So you can see p of y dy equal p of x dx. OK? And in general, this becomes the determinant of the Jacobian of the transformation from x coordinates uh, to y coordinates. So the bottom line is. If x hat is the map estimate of p of x, y hat is the, map, is the map estimate of p of y, y hat, it is not the same as f of x hat. All right? So, I mean, you can think you start with something, you go and you change units, uh, you expect that you have the same sort of map estimates in new units, but according to this equation, it tells you that is not going to happen. OK, and, and uh, this example basically demonstrates uh, what is going on. The map estimate does not transform the same way. Now, it comes out that uh, uh, if you use the maximum likelihood uh, uh, estimate, the MLD estimate of parameters, this is not a problem because you remember when we look at the likelihood, 
we don't look at it as a probability distribution. We look at it as a function of the parameters. That's how we define the MLE estimate, right? You write down the probability of the data, but you treat it as a function of the parameters, and then you optimize it. So the MLE transforms you know, accordingly to the function that you use from x to y, OK? Because the, the likelihood is a function of the parameters. It's not a probability distribution. And similarly, when you do predictions in a Bayesian setting, uh, and I remind you the predictive distribution is an integral of the likelihood times the posterior integrate of the parameter space, it comes out this is not an issue for predictions because since you integrate in parameter space, the integration basically introduces a Jacobian that somehow uh, uh, does not cause any uh, issues in, in, uh, in, uh, th with this parameterization, OK? Uh, but the map estimate has this pathology that you see here. OK, and, and uh, basically I have on this slide some uh, trivial examples. I'm not going to go through all of them. But imagine that. Uh, uh, this is a binary uh, classification problem, if you like. I define the probability of y equal to 1 to be mu, and I take a prior to be a uniform distribution, and I start doing sort of different parameterizations of mu. So if you look at uh, the prior, and I ask you for the map estimate, the map estimate can be anywhere from 0 to 1, okay? Because this is a uniform distribution. If you define a parameterization where theta is the square root of mu, and you use this uh, uh, change of distributions that I showed you before, the distribution of theta comes to be 2 times theta. So the map is, you know, th mu goes from 0 to 1, all right? So theta goes from 0 to 1. So the map estimate is theta equal to 1. Here it could have been anywhere from 0 to 1. Here with this parameterization, the map is theta equal to 1. Very weird, OK? If you use another parameterization, theta equal to 1 minus square root of 1 minus mu, it comes out, you can see from here, the map estimate is theta equal to 0. So keep that in mind that somehow uh, when you do change the parameterization, uh, uh, don't expect the map estimate to follow along. All right. Uh, what do you do with the map estimate if you actually want to correct this parameterization issue? I am not going to discuss it uh, in any detail today because uh, it requires basically adding this Fisher information matrix. Uh, when we discuss about prior models, I'm going to introduce the Fisher information matrix. But somehow, if in the product of the likelihood and the prior, you introduce this Fisher information matrix to the power minus one half, and you maximize this whole term there, this estimate is parameterization independent. OK? And uh, so this is sort of a little trick uh, that somehow is like modifying the prior. Literally, that's what it is, OK? You modify the prior so that theta hat basically is parameterization independent. This is, you don't see it often in practice because if you have this likelihood times priors times the Fisher uh, information to minus 1 half, to uh, calculate this in high, spa high dimensional spaces to do this optimization problem, it's a very difficult task, so nobody wants to, to bother uh, using this estimate. All right. Um, so I mentioned point estimates are not good. So let me rapidly go through uh, confidence intervals in a Bayesian way. So we have the posterior. And we want to calculate first uh, uh, what is called a credible central interval. All right? I'm going to try to limit myself to a few things here. So we're going to define. Uh, a credible central uh, interval, and uh, this is the definition. So we want, let's say, to define a central interval. So this is around the mean going from uh, L to U, so that the total probability mass in the posterior, when I integrate from L to U, is 1 minus alpha, where alpha is given. So let's say you want to find the central interval that has probability mass 95%. So the way we define it is go and compute L, go and compute U, all right, so that the uh, probability mass under the posterior is 1 minus alpha. And uh, we call this a central interval because, you know, there are uh, infinite ways otherwise to, to come up with these intervals here. I mean, you can move them to the left or the right. 
you can get exactly the same answer with some uh, uh, you know, uh, minor changes. So what we do is, uh, if this uh, region has probability one minus alpha, we are allow for probabilities alpha over two on the left tail and the right tail, right? And that's why this is a central interval. And the most famous central interval you know for the Gaussian is the mu plus minus two times the standard deviation. All right, so that interval contains 95% of the probability mass of the Gaussian. Uh, more precisely, is from uh, minus 196 of sigma to plus 196 of sigma uh, plus mu. And you can sort of do the same type of calculations for um, all the distributions, like the beta distribution. So you notice here, this requires, as you remember from elementary statistics, that you know the inverse CDF. So this sort of calculations don't um, sort of underestimate them if, you, if your problem is um, um, in high dimensions, being able to compute this, it's not easy. And that's why in high dimensions, you always sort of report uh, things, re intervals related to marginals of the posterior, not the actual posterior. Okay, you work with the marginals of the posterior so you can use sort of estimates that look like that. Uh, all right. Uh, there is a problem with uh, uh, this uh, central uh, credible intervals. And here is the problem. So, you know, here I have uh, a beta distribution. So this is a central interval, let's say, that contains 95% of the probability mass. But there is a problem. Notice that there are regions outside the central interval, for example, the region that you see here, where the probability is way higher, right? Way higher than the interval here. So how can you exclude this part, all right? OK? So this, there is a high probability there, but it's not accounted on this central interval. So there is a way to define a new set of uh, uh, intervals. And the one of interest here is what's called the highest posterior density uh, interval. And it's defined with this little formula here. You want to find a region where the probability is, is higher than some p star value to be estimated, so that this integral gives you 1 minus alpha. And uh, okay, so you want basically again to find some probability p star. So in this interval, all the probabilities are higher than p star, and when you integrate in that region, you get one minus alpha. Here is a sort of a schematic. Uh, this is what we did with the central interval, and the high probability density interval looks like this. All right. So you find an interval from here to there, and you notice inside that interval. All the probabilities are higher than this value here, point, uh, let's call it point 0.6, OK? Um, so there is a little uh, sort of algorithm that you have to run to be able to calculate this uh, uh, high probability density regions for posterior distributions. Again, uh, do not, you know, these are not necessarily trivial calculations because, for example, you may have uh, a situation where uh, you have uh, a multimodal distribution, so this uh, high probability density region is disconnected. So the central interval that you see here is connected, fully connected. One is next to each other, all right? So we have alpha over two on one tail, alpha over two on the other, and one minus alpha. But uh, you notice, how do we define the HPD? We define P star, all right, so the probabilities Inside these intervals are higher than p star, higher than this value, and the mass under this blue area is one minus alpha. Okay. So if you have a multimodal distribution, sort of, uh, you know, the objective is to find p star. So for uh, uh, and then integrate for all the probabilities higher than p star. So there is a little optimization routine that you have to write to do this type of calculations, and. Uh, you cannot do any of these type of things uh, literally in, um, in high dimensional uh, problems. So you have to use uh, uh, marginal distributions to do this. All right, so um, a lot of times, you know, I, I 
Uh, so in this course, I'm not going to spend uh, any time whatsoever to discuss about Monte Carlo methods, but uh, lots of uh, type of calculations like computing point estimates, credible intervals, uh, lots of these things can be addressed with Monte Carlo methods. And, and I have one example in the notes uh, that computes uh, an interval, basically, that will define what it is using Monte Carlo methods. So uh, imagine the following, and this is, uh, you try to buy a book from Amazon, and you, know, you come up with different sellers. Let's say you can buy used books. One has 90 positive reviews, the other one 10 negatives. Uh, and the seller two has two positive reviews and zero negatives, okay? So obviously, you cannot go and select seller two because he has zero negatives because the, the sample here is very small, all right? But you need to make a probabilistic decision from where do you buy a book, all right? So here is a way to do this uh, in a fully Bayesian setting. Um, you are gonna define theta one and theta two to be the reliabilities of the two sellers. You are gonna use a non-informative prior the way we did in the lecture last week. And then you're going to come up based on this uh, two data sets that you have, all right? So the first seller had 90 positives, 10 negatives. So the posterior of theta one given D1 is 91 and 11. Do you see that? From where the 91 and 11 came? 91 and 11. You remember? It's an informative prior. When you multiply them, it's the end one effect. Okay? So the probability of theta one, the posterior is uh, this beta. The probability of theta two is this beta. So effectively, you know what you're asking is, you are asking uh, to, comp to figure out if, uh, you know, uh, theta in what region, basically, if theta one is greater than theta two. So you really want to calculate the posterior probability of the event, theta one uh, greater than theta two, given the data sets D for the two sellers. And effectively, that transforms to this integral. And this integral involves integration in theta one, theta two. So you take the two posteriors, all right? Uh, basically, the, what you see here is the same as there. What you see there is the same as there. And you are asking to give you the answer, theta one minus theta two, I call it delta. You want to find the probability that the reliability of seller one is greater than that of seller two, given the data D. So basically, you want to compute this. So this is sort of uh, 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 a confidence interval, right? You want to have some confidence on the event delta greater than zero. And the only and easy way to compute this is with Monte Carlo uh, simulation. So effectively, what you need to do is you need to sample from this posterior. You need to sample from that posterior. And then uh, from this sample, start counting how many times theta 1 is greater than theta 2. And it comes out you can. Uh, compute basically a Monte Carlo approximation of this probability, okay? And, uh, and uh, it turns out this probability to be 0.718, okay? And the uh, interval for delta, delta is greater than zero is between those two blue lines, all right? Here is, you know, the two posteriors. So this region where theta one is greater than theta two has been expanded. And what you're looking is basically to compute this interval. And this uh, probability mass there is 0.718. Uh, I actually, just before I came, I was, uh, uh, there was a typo, I think, in, uh, in uh, Murphy's book uh, on a little discussion about Monte Carlo implementation. So there is a routine in, um, in uh, the statistical toolbox of MATLAB. And when you click about computing credible intervals with Monte Carlo methods, you will realize that that particular routine, it's huge because it gives you as a user many different choices on how to do it. So it's not a trivial topic, okay? It was like several hundreds of lines of, uh, of programming on how to do these type of simulations with Monte Carlo. Okay, so let's keep going. So we have the posterior, we have point estimates, we have uh, uh, this high probability density intervals that basically if you write papers, you have to report those. They're very important. So now let's uh, discuss a little bit about uh, uh, model selection and uh, model comparison, basically. So we already, I think, on uh, lecture one, 
I told you that uh, you know you fit the model using the training set, and then somehow you're going to do some uh, uh, testing of the performance of the trained model. And uh, one of the ways to do this is using uh, cross validation. So this is not sort of a Bayesian setting, but even Bayesian people do it. So what you do is you split the data in four pieces. So you train it on three pieces, and then you test on the fourth. Then you make this testing set to be this and that and that. And then you average, OK? Um, so obviously, the cost of this is very high because you're going to have to train the model, let's say, in this case, four times, all right? And, um, and literally, if you read the literature, it will tell you that somehow, even if you do this, you may still have to test the model on an extra data set. So this never ends, OK? So we may be able to do something a little bit better than this non-Bayesian uh, way of setting. So in the non-Bayesian world, uh, the way basically to select the complexity of a model to fit the data uh, comes with different criteria. And one of them that I will uh, come back at the end of the lecture today to compare it with a Bayesian setting is the criterion that looks like this. So basically it says, to find the appropriate complexity of a model to fit the data set, maximize the log likelihood minus the number of parameters in your model. OK? So notice that if, I, um, if, if you forget the SAM, all right, and I ask you to maximize the likelihood, what is the maximum number of parameters that uh, uh, you can have in increasing the likelihood? So let's say if I do a regression model or a classification, uh, what happens as the number of parameters increases? What happens to the likelihood? Increases. Increases. So basically, uh, you'll be getting a more complex model, more complex model, right, until you perfectly fit the data. So what you need to do is you say, yes, I want to fit the likelihood, but at the same time, I want basically to minimize the complexity of the model, so I want as few parameters as possible. Now notice that, uh, so the, the simple way that the complexity of the model comes here, so I am going to come back uh, to this model that basically has no Bayesian justification. I am only going to say here that this model uh, favors simple models, okay? And, and uh, so we will come back to this. Uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, later uh, in the lecture today. So uh, I am going to mention on this slide a few things that maybe uh, for those who have not taken a, a course uh, in regression may sort of uh, not resonate. But we will do regression models, so we will come back to this. So, but let me just mention, right? So we already saw in lecture one that if you use a lower order polynomial, all right? You underfit. So if you put a straight line, you underfit. If you use a 20th order polynomial, you overfit. Basically, you fit the nodes. Okay? Now, what you do is, when you do regression in a non Bayesian setting, you try to regularize the problem, right? You add some penalty terms to control the variability of the parameters in the model. And what happens is, if you use a small regularization parameter, you overfit. If you use a large regularization parameter, let's say if you control the parameters to go to zero, basically you get a straight line which is similar to having a lower order polynomial. So what we want to do is we want to find the Bayesian way that given the data set, uh, the, the, the model is capable of figuring out uh, what the appropriate complexity of the model is. And most importantly, we would like uh, a way to pick up the complexity of the model that doesn't depend too much on the data set, right? I mean, the model is either complex or it's very simple. It's not like I'm going to adjust to whatever data you gave me. All right, the models come, you know, they come with a certain complexity. So you may have a few data or more data points. You want something that captures the true complexity uh, of the model. So the Bayesian way is to actually produce a probability, a posterior distribution over models. All right? 
So for those who have not seen this before, uh, it may look a little bit weird. So uh, this little m is the model. So if you think of regression problems, uh, m equal to 1 can be using linear basis functions, m equal to 2 using quadratic, cubic, etc. D is the data set, right? And this is basically Bayes' rule. That's the normalization factor. And this is a posterior over mod. If somehow, and we will see how is that possible, you can compute this posterior over models, someone will say, you know what, then let me pick up the model uh, that maximizes this posterior. So this is like a map estimate over the posteriors over models. Okay? So this is called model selection. Now, do people actually uh, do this? You know, you will figure out actually shortly that doing this type of calculation is not very complicated. So if you hesitate because you think there's lots of algebra involved, I will demonstrate to you as we start doing examples in regression and classification later on, that, and today also, that the calculation that's involved here is actually trivial. So we can actually do this calculation. So let's see how this goes. So uh, the so let me uh, so this is the posterior, all right. This is the likelihood, okay. So for model M is the probability of the data, and this is a prior of its model. So let me do sort of a trivial assumption here. Let's say that all models are equivalent. So we're going to take a uniform prior over models. Right? So all models are equivalent. So if we try to maximize this posterior, it's the same as maximizing the evidence of the data for model M. OK? So maximizing this will be the same as maximizing this, the evidence of the data for model M. OK? Now, when you try to write the evidence of the, uh, of the, of the data, there are no parameters of the model involved there, right? So to be able to calculate the likelihood of the data given model M, you're going to have to bring the parameters because you can only calculate the likelihood given the parameters, right? In every problem, the likelihood is defined if you know the parameters. So what I do is I just bring the parameter state like using the product rule here. If you think of, on this expression, right, you can put comma theta and then integrate in theta, and then this joint distribution writing it as the probability of the given theta, and then the prior of theta for model M. Okay? So basically, uh, we have a, a way to calculate the evidence. This is the terminology we use the evidence of the data for model M, and this is really what we need to be able to calculate the posterior of a model. We will, of course, uh, do some algebra to show you uh, how this calculation may uh, uh, look like. Um, so you may ask, so we said here that uh, we should not use many parameters when we do MLE estimates, because the more the parameters, the higher the, uh, the, uh, the higher basically the likelihood. How about this model here? Am I allowed to use a very high dimensional parameter theta? You remember, we want to select a model that maximizes this. What is the effect of the parameters to this model? Can I use many parameters? Is this problem an unbounded optimization problem? So basically, the more the parameters, the higher the evidence is. What do you think? You understand the question, right? So in, 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 in maximum likelihood, the more parameters, the higher the likelihood. So here, this is not the likelihood, right? This is sort of the normalization factor in the Bayes rule, all right, for model M. And I'm asking, is it possible that the higher the dimensionality of theta, the higher the evidence? Because if that's the case, then we're doomed. Well, it comes out, that's not an issue that it doesn't necessarily mean that if you increase the dimensionality of theta, this will increase. The reason, you integrate the parameters out. 
The parameters don't stay there. You don't use a point estimate. The parameters are integrated up. Okay? And that's what saves us basically at the end of the day uh, to uh, be able to make sense out of uh, this uh, 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 Bayesian formalism. All right. There is, um, so we discussed that we need to uh, maximize the evidence of the data. And actually, I don't know in what, uh, in one of the textbooks, there was sort of um, a little quotation there that there is some similarity of calculating this evidence with cross-validation. And uh, so look at this exact formula. Imagine that the data set D consists of data points y1, y2, yn. I can write this using the product rule of probability exactly like this. And if you think about it, each of these terms looks like a cross-validation term. So this is the evidence, really, right? That's the probability of the data. But if you look at its term, what does it say? Given y1, compute y2. What do you do in cross-validation? Given some data, you do predictions in the rest of the data. What do you say here? Given y1 and y2, do predictions on y3. So it comes out, right? So there is a similarity of the evidence with this concept of cross-validation. And in some sense, um, if you overfit, let's say, this model, then the subsequent models basically will be completely ruined, and, and the model you selected uh, uh, will overfit. So cross-validation is, again, a non-Bayesian setting, but uh, somehow the way that you can write the evidence like that points that there is some similarity that somehow uh, both methodologies are trying in some way to do the same thing. All right, so uh, let me just go directly to what uh, we're interested in here. Uh, so uh, I changed a little bit the notation. I apologize for this, you know, cutting and pasting from uh, uh, other lectures. So I call the data set here uh, basically uh, bold X. Uh, I put a subscript I for the different uh, uh, models and fit i for the parameters of the different models. So fit i is the parameters of models mi, x is the data. So what you see here is, what is this? How should I, what type of quantity is this? Don't bother the fact that I use f and pi and all of the things. What is this here for model i? Everything is conditional on model i, so what is this? What is it? I mean, I see here the prior of the parameters. What is that? That's the likelihood, all right, of the data for model i, and that's the marginalization factor. Okay, so uh, so this is the posterior of the parameters for model i. Okay, and uh, notice in the denominator, I have the probability of the data for that given model. That's my evidence. All right. So if you really do the posterior calculation and you normalize the posterior then you can use Bayes rule and then you can come up with a posterior of model i given the data x so you can write this as the likelihood of the data under model mi which is this term here times the prior or, or model mi divided by the marginalization factor x which is summing basically all the numerators for all model i for all models i okay so that's p of x. There's no index there. All right. Uh, and uh, what is this term here? This is very important, this blue term. This blue term is basically, there is no parameters theta. So uh, to be able to calculate uh, this uh, uh, marginal likelihood, the evidence for model mi, as I showed you in the previous slide, what we need to do is we need to bring back the parameters theta. All right. So this is the prior of the parameters for model mi, this is the likelihood, and then integrate uh, the parameter sum. So effectively, if I have two models, uh, M1 and M2, and I want to compare which model uh, uh, you know, best explains the data, uh, what you can think is computing the ratio of the posteriors of the two models, all right? And the ratio of the posteriors is the ratio of the evidence of the two models uh, multiplied with the priors of model M1 and M2. And I write 
this uh, evidence ratio explicitly. And then I have a ratio of the two priors. So this ratio of the two um, uh, evidences under model M1 and M2 is called the Vegas factor. Okay? So basically, the Vegas factor is nothing else but the ratio of the marginal likelihoods of the two models. And somehow, uh, in practice, we often use this uh, to refer to, to do model comparison by assuming that the priors of the two models are the same, so they are uniform priors, so we don't really account for this. But you notice, really, if you want the posterior, is the biggest factor times the ratio of the priors. Okay? So to be able to calculate, again, the evidence for its model, you need to be able to integrate over the parameter space, okay, and the way that you see explicitly. So this is this integrals, right? They're the denominators in the Bayes rule that you see uh, there, right? So this factor, that blue thing there, is the integral of the numerator over phi i, and this is what I have here. All right. Uh, so there are some uh, simple examples in the notes. There is really uh, no significant value for me to to go through in details. But let me just say that if you play, let's say, if you have some data and you have one model, this is a coin toss problem, and you say, model M1 is the coin is fair, model M2 the coin is unfair, you collect this data, and you compute explicitly uh, the posterior probabilities of the two models, you come up with the, so model one is the fair coin, model two is the unfair coin, it comes that this probability is 2.58 times the ratio of the priors. And the message that I wanted to tell you here is that, you know, whatever you assume about the priors can really overturn upside down the ratio defined uh, in the biggest factor. So if you don't say, you know, P of M1 is the same as P of M2, they are all uniform, and, and so this points uh, that the coin is fair, all right? I can select anything I want here and I can change this number to whatever you want me to change. Okay? So, uh, and obviously that subjective uh, uh, sort of knowledge that you need to bring in regarding the priors can completely uh, mess things up. Uh, so here is the same example where the evidence points basically that the coin is not fair because it always comes with heads. And you can see now if you compare the fair posterior versus the unfair posterior, this number becomes 0.13. That tells you basically the model, uh, the highest, the evidence points towards model M M2. So this is the uh, a table uh, that you need to use to make decisions as to what model is uh, uh, basically, for what model there is evidence from the data that is the right model. And uh, the table that you see is extremely conservative. So you don't say, oh, when this ratio is greater than one, this model is better. No. Look at that. If you want to say, uh, so if you compare, let's say, model one and model zero, if you want to have to say, I have uh, certain, you know, I have overwhelming evidence for model M1, then, you know, the biggest factor has to be higher than 100. All right? Not one, 100. People want to be really, if you know, you have to be accounting for risk. You say, you know what? One is not good. It has to be 100. Okay? And similarly here for uh, anything in between, basically. So this is a good uh, table if you want to, uh, to compare things. Okay. And um, th uh, this example that I saw you with, uh, uh, with the coin toss, you can actually uh, uh, plot things. Uh, for different, you know, for a particular case of data sets. So I'm not gonna go through all the examples, but basically what you see here is a plotting uh, of the Vegas factor that compares model one versus model zero. And on uh, the horizontal axis is how many times you've got heads. And uh, so you see here one, two, three, four, and five. So you notice if you, if uh, in an experiment of uh, five trials, you get, two times or three times head, which model is basically the evidence points to? 
So one is the unfair coin, zero is the fair coin. So looking at this number, this is one here. So the evidence points, if you're in this region, to what model? To the fair coin. But you notice when you start getting the extremes, right? The biggest factors go up, okay? So this is sort of a nice way to visualize um, um, you know, this, uh, the comparison, if you like, of models uh, uh, in, in a Bayesian setting. But the way the biggest factors alone, like if you try to write uh, evidence for one model, doesn't necessarily tell you very much. This is the biggest factors are good to compare one model versus another model, okay? Uh, so you will always see uh, BF10 or BF01 always comparing with the uh, H0 hypothesis. Um, so one, uh, uh, I'm not going to go through all the details of the slide. Uh, so let me just say the following thing. When you use uh, priors, all right, when you use priors for uh, the parameters for each model that uh, they are uh, improper, all right, the biggest factors can be anything you want to. So caution, basically, if you go and use uh, improper priors for the parameters, uh, you can get sort of garbage. And what I mean improper priors, it's not like you're simply going to say, oh, the mean is a uniform distribution for this Gaussian. You can maybe take, you know, or say, um, uh, I don't have any knowledge for the variance, so the variance can be anything, all right? So if you sort of, even if you have a proper distribution, but you push it to this uh, uh, limit of uh, a vague prior, you get exactly the same problem. And uh, so if you follow the calculation here, right, comparing basically I have two models, M0 and M1, I am repeating all the previous formulas that I had. And what I'm writing here is the posterior of model M0, I'm writing it explicitly, uh, for the case where for model M0, the priors of the parameters is uh, a constant C0, let's say uniform equal to one, and for model M1, the, uh, another constant C1. So when you do the calculation and you rearrange things, there is a ratio here of C1 over C0, and depending on what values you use, you can make this to be anything you want to. All right? So basically, uh, this leads to what is called the Jeffries Lindley paradox. But really, I, I, I was just checking before I came uh, uh, more details from where the terminology comes. The paradox actually comes that if you use this idea in a Bayesian setting and you do model comparison in a non Bayesian setting, you can get answers that they are uh, opposite to each other. And the problem is basically that in a Bayesian setting, uh, you can manipulate the answers to be anything you want to uh, when you have this, uh, uh, you know, vague priors, this uniform priors that you see here, okay? So bottom line is, uh, when you do model selection, you need to be sure that you use a proper prior, otherwise the results can be manipulated uh, uh, to your advantage and you can give answers any way you would like them to be, okay? So you have to use proper priors uh, for model selection. Okay, uh, the next three slides are extremely fundamental and, and uh, you will see these slides in presentations basically given in very def different sort of, uh, uh, in a different context, but they're very fundamental to, to sort of uh, communicate this uh, concept of how models are selected and in particular to advocate what's called the Occam's razor uh, that effectively says that the best models are the simplest models. So uh, let's be sure we understand this, okay? Um, so what I have here is I have three models and uh, what I do is on the horizontal axis, I put the data sets that each model can explain. So it's a little bit sort of a, a vague way of, of plotting things, right? So, uh, and on the vertical axis, I have the probability of the data, which is really my evidence uh, for its model M. So if you look at model M3, 
model M3 explains a lot of different data sets. So what type of a model M3 is? Is it a simple model or it's a complex model? It's a complex model, all right? So M3 is a complex model, but you notice it explains a lot of data sets, but each of these data sets is explained with probability that is what? Very low. Why is that? Because effectively, when I sum over all data sets, right, all these probabilities have to sum to one. And by the way, this goes also to that uh, uh, example that we were discussing uh, in, um, uh, with, a concept, with a number con concept, you know, in uh, thing lecture two, right? And we said that the likelihood is, uh, you know, we use it as a uniform, and it was one over the, the number of, um, of numbers explained by each concept, right? And so the more the concepts you can, exp the more the numbers you can explain, the lower of probability, one over, uh, uh, you know, the number H that we had on lecture two. So model two is somewhere in between. It can only explain, you know, as a little bit smaller class of data, but with a higher probability. And then uh, this other yellow model is a very simple model. Uh, it explains a few data sets, but with very high probability. And as you can see, it cannot explain let's say my observations D that are given there, or <coughs> basically give zero probability to that. So the idea here is uh, the correct model that explains this data is somewhere in between, and that's model M2. Uh, and uh, the key equation, if you like, is this uh, integral or summation over all data sets. So a model explains data, the probabilities, this uh, marginal likelihood you have to sum for all data sets to one. So the more complex the model, the lower the probabilities. Um, and the, the simpler the model, the higher probability assigns, but to uh, very few data sets. OK, um, how does this look in practice? In this calculation, uh, you know, we will uh, work it out in details, mathematically speaking, when we do regression problems. Um, as surrogate models. And, and so if you think of this as your data set and you try to do Bayesian analysis, how it doesn't really matter, but you know, here the regression um, line is a straight line, here's a parabola, here is, I don't know what order of polynomial. So this is complexity low, intermediate complexity, higher complexity. Uh, so similar idea, right, with uh, the general picture that we just discussed. And um, uh, the same problem now with uh, regression. I am not going to tell you from where these plots have come or what they mean. Uh, so here are, we're trying to fit again uh, a, a regression a model to these data sets, okay? This is the actual uh, generating curve. So this is actually the truth. And, and this is the mean of the predictions that we get. So this is a simple model. All right, so this is a, a little bit uh, uh, like, uh, uh, it seems to me this uh, regression line looks like quadratic. This is maybe cubic. I see D equal to three, all right? And uh, what we will be able to do using uh, the formulas that you saw in the earlier slides, we're going to be able to compute the posterior over models given these data sets, given these dots, and plot these posteriors together. So when you look at this, what is the best model? So this is the order of the polynomial that we use to do the fitting. So using these posteriors, what is the best, uh, uh, the best model? Is the straight line, m equal to 1. All right? So the best line for this data set is m equal to 1. Now, again, we will do this in detail when uh, we reach a point, but the calculation is not going to be very complicated. I wanted to break this now because we discussed this in a general setting, all right? So we calculate the posteriors, and you can see model one has the maximum, basically, uh, the maximum uh, posterior. So it's basically the, the simplest model is the one that we choose. Now, for another data set with more data points, all right, somehow the model uh, picks up an intermediate complexity, then you can see 
the overwhelming now higher value for uh, the quadratic model, all right? Way higher posterior probability versus the straight line of the Jupiter. Okay, and you can see also from the results, model two is is uh, uh, the one to use. By the way, all of these things come with uh, uh, little maglab routines. Uh, this particular example will not make sense now unless you have seen this from uh, uh, my, the earlier course in the fall. But we will come back and we will do all the details for these calculations that you see on the slides. But again. Somehow, we're going to have to calculate posterior over models for regression. And, and we looking at them, we will decide which model best explains uh, the given data. All right. So um, let's continue with, uh, so you know, we are going to calculate this um, uh, marginal likelihood for uh, uh, you know, regression later on. But can I tell you something, uh, something general on how you actually are going to compute this, OK? So we need to compute this integral. This is the evidence, all right? This is the evidence for model M, all right? And this evidence, basically, this is what we need to calculate the posterior over models. So this requires some integration uh, in parameter steps. The calculation of the evidence is extremely simple if you understand it. And everything you need to know is on this slide, all right? Everything you need to know, it's on this slide. So what is the equation that you see here? So I work for a model. I'm only working for one model. So what do we see here? This is just Vegas rule for the parameters, right? The, that's the posterior, the prior, the likelihood. And that's the evidence. That's what I want to compute for that model. So for that model, really, what we want to compute is P of D. Remember when, you know, like we, we work with beta distributions and the reflect distributions, they have some functional terms like theta to some power, and then they have some normalization terms. So what I do is I put all the normalization terms for the different distributions out explicitly. So what I say is, look, the posterior is some terms that involve the parameter theta divided by some normalization constant, OK? And the notation basically says, if I have n data point, I'm going to call the normalization constant Zn. Okay? Similarly, q theta is the unnormalized part of the prior. Z0 is the normalization of the prior. And similarly, this is my unnormalized likelihood. And Zl is the normalization factor for the likelihood. So if you solve this, so this will cancel with this, will cancel with that, right? Because all the terms in theta will cancel out. Right? So all the terms will cancel out. And what you get is you get that the, uh, the marginal likelihood is basically the ratio of the normalization constant of the posterior divided by the normalization constant of the prior times the normalization constant uh, of the likelihood. So effectively, if you know how to compute normalization constants of distributions, there is your marginal likelihood, and you're in business. OK? And this is, you know, so when you plug in things, equations will start looking complex, but all the complexity comes from this trivial equation. P of D equal the normalization of the posterior, divided the normalization constant of the prior, and the normalization of the likelihood. So let me give you some uh, examples. Uh, let's take that the likelihood is a binomial thing, right? So the coin tossing, you say, in uh, n trials, I get uh, uh, n1 times, let's say, heads, and n0 times um, uh, tails. Uh, the conjugate prior is a beta distribution, which looks like this. So I'm writing everything explicitly, all right? So. This is the posterior equal the prior times the likelihood divided by the marginal likelihood, so 1 over PD. So what is this? That's my prior, right? OK? So that's my prior. Uh, what is this? That's the likelihood. And don't forget, because we already have done this in an earlier lecture, the posterior is what type of distribution? 
It's a beta with updated parameters, a prime to be a plus n1 and b prime to be b plus n0. You remember that? All right? So the normalization factor of the posterior, what it is? 1 over b for parameters a plus n1, b plus n0. So this is 1 over pd, n over uh, factorial n1, and then 1 over the beta distribution a bit. And uh, the theta terms and 1 minus theta terms cancel from the posterior and prior and likelihood. And basically, uh, the evidence for this beta binomial problem is exactly this very nice expression. So, uh, you know, so it looks simple, right? But remember, the objective in, in, uh, in model selection is to figure out which model best explains the data, which model has the maximum evidence. And in this case, you, if you have different models, you're going to have sort of to optimize with uh, this evidence with whatever parameters there are in this evidence. So for example, you can say, what alpha and beta should I use to actually maximize this evidence? And being able to take derivatives of the complex normalization factors that come in distributions is basically something you need to have your hands on to be able to optimize the evidence. Okay? And there are papers uh, that I have in the notes that you can link the, and software that goes with it that allows you to do this type of calculations. Uh, so here's another example uh, in computing the evidence for uh, generalizing the previous case for the multi nulli likelihood and Dirichlet prior. So basically the evidence looks like this, okay? Uh, ratio of gamma functions, okay? Looks complicated, but you know what? Um, uh, we can deal with it. And uh, here is something even more uh, important that uh, looks very complicated, but it's actually very trivial, also an extremely powerful type of calculation. And it has to do with the multivariate normal distribution. So in the multivariate normal distribution, what is the conjugate for mu and the covariant sigma for those who took the class um, you know, last uh, fall. What's the conjugate prior for the, for the mean and the covariance? So if you try to do, uh, you know, uh, one computer posterior of mu and sigma, what is the conjugate prior? The answer is, is the normal inverse wizard distribution, okay? Uh, but the way for anybody who, uh, you know, since I am not going to review anything about Gaussian distributions in this course, anybody who wants to look for more details, you can read um, um, either Bishop's, I think, chapter three or uh, uh, Murphy's chapter two, basically, to see these calculations. But effectively, what we need is we need a conjugate prior that has the form uh, that given sigma, the prior on mu is a Gaussian that you see here. And then uh, uh, the uh, distribution for sigma is an inverse wizard, okay? It's a distribution over symmetric positive definite matrices. I give you the exact expression, right? Nothing for you to bother, everything is here. And I also give you the normalization factor. Where did I got this normalization factor? Wikipedia, <laughs> okay? If you click on Wikipedia normal inverse wizard, Basically, you get this nice normalization part. So what is the evidence of the data is the normalization factor of the posterior, which is a normal inverse wizard with updated parameters. That's why you see the subscript n divided by the normalization of the prior, divided by the normalization of the likelihood. So it comes out that the evidence uh, for this uh, case of the multivariable multivariate Gaussian is this very nice expression, okay? And uh, uh, again, it, it is, uh, you think it's complicated, but actually it has a very nice form. The complexity comes when you try to optimize this with whatever parameters that define the complexity of this model, okay? So this is easy, but you know, if you're gonna compare evidences, it's not just you go and you calculate this, you say, now I want to optimize with respect to 
new zero and uh, the dimensionality d and, and uh, other goodies, okay? I see it's 145, so what I'm gonna do is I am going to abandon you there, and then what I'm gonna do on, uh, uh, on the lecture on Thursday, I am going to give you an approximation of this using, uh, uh, approximating basically the posterior with a Gaussian using the Laplace approximation and trying to have some nice close form approximation of the evidence that it's easier to work with than this otherwise complicated looking forms. Okay? So you can read the rest of the slides. There's office hours today. If anybody wants to see me, you can email me. I'll be available on an appointment uh, every day this week as well. All right, so we'll see you on, uh, on Thursday. R R I. Uh, yeah, it's um, okay. Wait. It's across uh, the ACMS okay. building. It's, it's uh, uh, designed something outside. What's the time for? Uh, Four thirty to five thirty. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah.